my name is uh, Professor Chrissy Tope of the University of Ghana School of Public Health. Um, I'm going to facilitate this session, this question and answer session. Thank you very much, Peter and uh, Rashida, for an excellent presentation. And I think we'll get straight to um, the questions that we have available. The first one actually goes to you, Rashida. It came from Caroline Mubera. It says that over treatment of false negatives is acceptable and better than non-treatment of um, non-treatment of uh, uh, possible uh, positives. And then they were asking, are there any studies on resistance guided treatments uh, in this case? And then what are the chances of false positives developing drug resistance from multiple false negative treatments? Over to you, Rashida. Thank you for that question. I think that's going to vary depending on the uh, infection you're talking about. In syphilis, we don't really have uh, a huge concern about antimicrobial resistance as we do for gonorrhea. So in that premise, uh, the treatment that we use is penicillin. And in that premise, the risk of under treatment, oh, sorry, um, over treatment with uh, either for false positives, biological false positives, or uh, um, you know, past infection is not a huge concern, particularly because in many settings, past, inf uh, tr past uh, treatment is so low that most of the infections that we will be picking up is going to be new infections. So obviously the concern is going to be different for different infections. So currently the accepted guidance is that for syphilis, even the current RDTs that exist are great. Um, and, but there are, as I said earlier, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, what can I say? The, the, the assay is coming out that will distinguish between past and present infection. Okay, so Rashida, so um, there is still another question for you uh, from Peter. It says, how can researchers better articulate to policymakers uh, that is global and at the national level the importance of STI prevention? I mean, that's an Thank you for that question. It's an absolutely excellent question because I think that's where HIV has done spectacularly well compared to STIs. And part of the uh, failure of uh, STIs is not the STIs themselves, but the fact that the STI world was overshadowed by HIV and there was a splintering between HIV and STI programs, whereas in fact HIV is largely an STI itself. So I think that going on now, we have uh, a, a strategy which is exciting and which brings in many of the lessons that have come in from uh, HIV itself and, uh, and something that is implement implementable and uh, we're very able to draw on many of the kind of important frameworks that are being talked about. But we still need to go back and link it A to the importance with respect to preventing HIV transmission. And that is something we can do to make it a little bit more palatable to many of the policymakers and funders who love HIV. And secondly, I think we need to kind of articulate how much morbidity and mortality HIV, uh, STIs cause, um, not just H focusing on HIV, but the other STIs as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Peter, I have a couple of questions for you. The first one has to do with, the, you mentioned that um, uh, implementation science research is actually confounded by uh, operational research. Now, the question is, what is the difference? Oh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kwasi. Yes, there is a difference, although it's a bit subtle, um, but uh, operations research is um, almost close to what we call optimization modeling, so that, you know, you just, um, it's something that's picked from industrial technology, where you, you're trying to look at the various components of the health system and, uh, and tweak them and, and see which of those components uh, will deliver you the best value for money. So, um, and so how much, let's say, human resource do you need to put um, into the system and how much investments you need compared to uh, maybe putting in some other level of infrastructure. So um, it, it's, it's operational research is actually a subset of uh, implementation science. Um, but its use is mainly really around looking at efficiencies within the system. Uh, so, you know, it's it's like, um, it's just a terminology that has been used historically and, um, and it's been used for a very long time so that when implementation science came up, people thought it's just an extension of a 
operations research, but um, we need operations research for sure, um, uh, but we need it as part of implementation science. Okay, then the second one um, uh, from Peter, is how can implementation science highlight best practices in COVID-19 control from Africa that we need to learn from in the global north? Well, that's a tricky question. Uh, I'm not so sure we have a lot of lessons to learn from Africa. Uh, probably maybe uh, in Asia or something else. But um, I, I mean, we could say that, you know, there could be some uh, lessons learned around contact tracing, uh, possibly, and there could be areas in Africa where we do that a little bit more efficiently. Um, and again, I think because of our resources, it's also possible that we may have done differentiated care a little bit more. But even then, um, with differentiated care, ensuring that you know we have more of the maybe home-based care for the mildly symptomatic, I don't think we've even gone beyond that to really like evaluate um, the impact of all those strategies. So yes, there are more with sort of interventions that are done. Um, maybe out of really the reality that resources are limited, but there's still a challenge in that we are not really integrating the research part of it, the evaluation component of it. It's implementation science one, well, yes, uh, but we're not able to say for certain that, you know, we've done this and these were the outcomes. And, and this is what we probably saved the healthcare system by doing a differentiated uh, care. So yeah, it's a tricky question, we wish we could we, there are lessons in HIV that we, we can take the global north, definitely, a lot of them. But I'm not so sure about COVID-19. I think um, history will probably bear us out. Okay, thank you okay. very much, Peter. So, Rashida, in one minute, in your presentation, you showed high levels of viral STIs, uh, particularly HPV and uh, HSV in the African region. Apart from condom use, is there any reason for this? For reasons for the high levels, Peter? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, so uh, there have been a number of different reasons proposed, and one of them is sexual concurrency um, that that allows for more efficient spread. Um, and uh, so that might explain some of the reasons. I mean, obviously, the HPV vaccine has been um, slower to be implemented in the African continent than in other countries. Uh, there's obviously less... Uh, Less level, uh, lower levels of screening. So some of those could explain uh, uh, the reasons. I mean, the higher levels of HSV two in Africa are not completely understood, but um, it may uh, it clearly sexual behavior will play a role. All right, thank you very much, um, Peter and Rashida, for bringing implementation science research and STI to the front banner. Um, I would also like to thank my co-chairs, uh, Kate and then uh, Francois, and for you, the audience. Thank you very much for being active and thank you. Thank you.